Hi everyone, and welcome to the very, very first episode of the Cosmopolitan Globalist podcast. I'm Mo, and I'm based in Siena, Italy. And as you may know, the globalists are based all over the world. If you're a reader or you're new to us, many, many warm, warm thanks for listening in today. We sincerely hope that you enjoy our chat. Now today, we'd like you to get to know us just a little more. So without any further ado, let me bring in everyone who is in the chat and participating today. Let's start with you, Claire. Hi, Claire. How are you today? Hi, Mo. I'm doing very well. Thank you, especially since yesterday I got my first Pfizer vaccination. Oh, that's fabulous, Claire. How are you feeling today? You're feeling okay. Oh, I'm feeling better than okay. I'm feeling better than I have in a year. It was incredible relief, bordering on exhilaration to get it. I understand because I had my AstraZeneca jab about 10 days ago. And I don't know about you, Claire, but the first thing that I actually thought was, first of all, the relief, okay, that I got this. And then I think we were talking about this before, Claire, we sort of, you know, hope that this gets out to a whole bunch of other people, because this is absolutely fundamental for us to go forward. What do you think about that, Claire? I, I felt that right outside the vaccination center, there should have been a stand saying, would you like to share this relief with other people? And so that you could immediately open your wallet or take out your credit card and pay for five or 10 or 15 people to be vaccinated in parts of the world where the pandemic isn't going to be over anytime soon because they're poor countries. Yeah. And this is such an obvious thing to do. I don't know why this isn't standard procedure. Yeah. Not mandatory, just if you're yeah. feeling good because you don't have to worry about this anymore. Maybe yeah. you'd like to share that, Joy. Yeah, exactly. Let's. I'd like to continue on this on this vein, but I want to bring John into the conversation. Hi, John. How are you? Hi, Malik. I'm very good. Good. Yeah. Where are you calling Considering us? the circumstances, as we like to say in Germany. Yeah, yeah. I'm calling you from Vienna, Austria. Whoa. Okay. So from Vienna, great stuff. Great stuff. How are things going there in Austria in terms of the, the pandemic? Not great. I would say, to be honest, we are uh, experiencing what could be another wave. We'll see what's happening, but the government has decided that uh, they're just going to keep opening up anyway. Okay. The government seems to be sort of on a course. So as long as the ICUs aren't overburdened, they're just going to keep going. Yeah. I guess and it's the economy. Yeah, that's what they're thinking. The economy is, is yeah. one of the worst in Europe last okay. quarter. Okay. Yeah. The ICUs in France are 94%. Wow. I think in right. Italy, yeah. we're at, if I'm not mistaken, 68 to 70%. I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I haven't checked this morning. Did you get your jab? No, no. Not, no, we, not even a, a hint of getting vaccinated. Not, a, not even a hint of it happening. In Austria, we are uh, very behind in vaccinations. The government keeps telling us they're bringing in more vaccines, but I think they, you know, we had some trouble with AstraZeneca a few weeks ago where some nurses died of blood clotting in okay. Tyrol. That got people worried. We don't have really enough Pfizer. A lot of people are pushing to get the Russian vaccine permitted. Wow. That hasn't happened yet. Yeah. I think yeah, now I they're sort of that. banking on Johnson and Johnson maybe sending us some supplies. Yeah. Personally, I think there's going to be a big flood of Americans flying to the U.S. in May. America keeps going at the rate it's going. John, you're older than you look, if I recall, which should put you higher up the priority list for them. When do they think they're going to be getting around to vaccinating your age group? In the 50s? No firm date. What That's about why I think in the U.S. it'll be much easier. By U.S., I'm sure by May it won't be a problem. Hmm. What about if you're in your 50s and you have a comorbidity? Then you're in better shape. But they've still been focusing mostly on old people, people with mm. political connections, which has gotten oh, some people wow. angry, school teachers, actually, which makes some sense. Yeah. Because yeah. almost everyone has some comorbidity. Yeah, if you think <laughs> about it. Sure. enough, I'm sure you're right. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure. But before That's we go true. forward, I want to bring in Vivek into this conversation. Vivek, hello. How are you? Oh, very well, Mo. Thank you. Good. And I'm where? Based in Mumbai, India. Okay, so you're in Mumbai. So, yeah. Now, from so what I'm I know, about four and a half hours away from you. 
That's right. That's right. In fact, to get this podcast together, we had to think of a time that would have been okay for everyone because the globalists are all over the world, as I said before. So now Claire and Vivek, let's start off with a basic question because I think people who are new to the globalists would like a little more information on us. How did you and Vivek start the globalists? Well, this is a great story. Vivek and I are old co-workers. We worked together for the original print version of Asia Times in Bangkok. Wow. How did I end up in Bangkok working for Asia Times? Well, I had just finished my doctorate in, at Oxford and I'd been in graduate school for, it, it felt as if I'd been in graduate school for a century. And the expected thing for me to do at that point was to look for postdocs and, and tenure track jobs and continue doing exactly what I'd been doing for the past century. And I found myself thinking, I can't face it. I've got to do something different. I've got to do something that gets me out of academia. And I was paging through The Economist, and this is back when Help Wanted ads were in The Economist, and the back pages of it. And I saw an ad that said, um, Asia Times in Bangkok is looking for experienced sub-editors with a profound knowledge of Asia. And I looked at that and I thought, well, I'm not an experienced sub-editor. I could probably find China on a map. <laughs> but, you know, I have a degree from Oxford. So that, that, that might open some doors if they're sure. not asking too many questions. And so indeed, they invited me to an interview. And it was, the interview was in London. And I walked in and there's these two guys. Vivek, do you remember how they were just covered in nicotine from head to toe? I mean, they, they're, everything about them was stained yellow from cigarette smoke. It was hard even to tell where the humans were. It was just, just this yeah. dense ball of smoke. They asked me a question, and I can't remember what the question was now, but I remember that it was just the luckiest question in the world because just the night before I'd been at a dinner party where they were talking about Black Shoals pricing models. And so I, I happened to know this theoretical stuff about Black Shoals pricing models, and I just spun it. Right, the whole thing. Praying they asked no follow on questions. <laughs> And the only follow-on question they asked was, do you smoke? Uh -huh. Oh, my God. <laughs> I looked at them and I said, no, but if the job requires it, I'll learn. <laughs> <laughs> I wound up in Bangkok, where I'd never been before. I'd never been to Asia before. And it was an incredible time to be in Bangkok because it was the height mm. of the pre-collapse. It was 1995 when, when people really thought, this is it. The Asian century is upon us. And... Right. Thailand is experiencing eight, nine percent growth per annum, which is just an incredible thing to see. It's an incredible mood yeah. to be part of. And I wound up learning a lot about Asia, working on the copy desk of Asia Times. Vivek, how did you discover Asia Times? How did you wind up working in Bangkok? Well, you weren't in Bangkok, you were in India, but how did you wind up with that organization? I mean, someone called me up the previous evening, one evening, and said, there's these two guys who are starting a newspaper in Bangkok and do you want to meet them? So I just went there and met them. And two weeks later, I found a job offer in my mail. <laughs> yeah, they had an incredible amount of money. They were being funded by some Thai, I guess back then we didn't have billionaires, but he was the closest thing we, there was to a billionaire who really spared no expenses. Uh, what was his name? It was... Um, Sondi Lim Tongkul. That's right, Sondi Lim Tongkul, who, who would stride into the office maybe once every couple of months, surrounded by 15 beautiful Chinese air hostesses. And he'd make some pronunciation about how important it was to counter the white man's imperial journalism. And he'd stride back out, leaving a cloud of wow. money behind him. Wow, <laughs> wow, wow. Wow. And uh, subsequently, he went belly up in the, in, the, in the financial crisis, and he wound up taking to the streets with a begging bowl. Wow. Now, Claire, you and Vivek, how did you actually come up with the idea of the, of the globalists? Oh, Vivek, do you want to take that? I guess we kept cribbing on Twitter and Facebook about what's happening in the media these days. And we just seemed to say that we hated it. And then Claire said, why don't I get some of my friends over to start something and just stop all this nonsense that's happening in the media. And I said, yeah, let's discuss that offline. And 
bingo. And that's three it. hours later or four hours later, we had we had the idea for the cosmopolitan globalist. And a couple of weeks later, was it two or three weeks, Claire? We just launched. It, it was amazing because I, I had been complaining about the state of the media for we can if if you think your listeners would be interested, I can tell you the whole history of the decline of the yeah, no, we'll get to that because that was going to be one of my questions. Actually, I wanted to ask John before we do jump in to that, Claire. John, how did you hook up with the globalists? I had been following Claire on Twitter for a while. When I saw the call, I, I answered the call. And I should be looking for something, <laughs> something like that to do. I've been increasingly frustrated. It's interesting as an expat looking back in America and the polarization in America seems to have led to a situation where... Americans on both sides seem to have um, very unrealistic ideas about what's going on in Europe. On the left, they tend to idealize it as some social democracy, democratic utopia, and the right sees it as a chaotic hellhole filled with immigrants raping right. and pillaging everybody. Yeah. So what was happening in the media today that, let's say, triggered, right, the globalists? <laughs> Let me begin with the founding anecdote, the straw that broke the camel's back. A few months ago, or in, in, in October, there was a, a horrific crime in France. A school teacher teaching at a public school in a leafy, pleasant Parisian suburb had taught a class about freedom of expression using the cartoons from Charlie Hebdo to illustrate the lesson. And he was beheaded in broad daylight by an Islamist terrorist. New York Times ran with the headline, police shoot man after knife crime. Yeah. Now, is that the headline you would use to describe what just happened? Yeah. It was as if the New York Times couldn't, couldn't get its head around the idea that the story wasn't a yet another police overreaction to a minority doing something minor. <laughs> Right. They just couldn't get their heads around it. And they were, they were correctly pilloried for that in France. And for the French, the French are furious with the New York Times because every other day we get another story from, mm -hmm. from the New York Times about France's racial reckoning. France isn't having a racial reckoning. Yeah. <laughs> this, is, this is an American What are they seeing? You know, I live here, <laughs> right? You're in right. Paris. You would know about this. Yeah, that's right. that's right. And I have found that growingly, for reasons we can discuss, the American, well, the Anglophone media, the English language media, it's doing completely inadequate reporting on all foreign news stories. It, it's either not covering them at all, that's the main, main problem, absolutely no coverage, or if it is, it's covering them in an extremely superficial way. Often the reporters know nothing about the places they're reporting from, and then by the time it gets to the editing process, it resembles an American news story, so that the American reader would have no real idea that foreign countries are very different and have different problems than Americans have. And there are a lot of, there are a lot of structural technical reasons for that, but that was the straw that broke mm -hmm. the camel's back. And I put out a tweet. I said, look, I want to start a new media organization that responds to these problems. I don't know. We'll call it the globalist or something. Who wants to join me? One tweet. And I didn't really expect the response we got, which was overwhelming, hmm. overwhelming. Hundreds of people said, I'm in. Really? Yeah. Wow. How many people are now contributing, Claire? Say, yeah, 88 people have shown an interest in contributing. That's fabulous. Absolutely. In 88 incredible people. Yeah, but they come from Every all different fields, right, Every Claire? Background. I mean, John, what's your field? You contribute was, quite a bit. What's your field? Primarily on European economic issues and political issues. I'm actually a, a business person by background. Okay. And actually more of a, uh, originally I was a, what you then was called a Soviet specialist, specialist in Soviet Union, as a consultant and investor in Central Europe for the past 10 years, the EU part of Central Europe, Poland, Czech Republic, Romania, Balkans. Wow. John, Great. by the way, speaks seven languages fluently. Is that correct? Seven, John. And this is yes. This isn't just, up in Europe. 
Yeah, well, we yeah, spoke Italian really before, Claire. Really, not just a passing acquaintance. But really yeah, no, 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 no. Look, Claire, before we, we started, right. no recording, I mean, John and I were speaking in Italian together. So, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And Vivek, what topics are you writing on? I mean, we've read all your articles and stuff like that. For people that don't know, right, that would, would like to start reading The Globalist, what kind of topics are you writing on? My interests are primarily in business and economics, especially political economy. So I've been trying the five or six articles that I think I've written. I've been trying to primarily focus on putting some of the India stories and what's happening in Asia with China into context. One of the things that I realized over the last 10 years is that media, whether it's in India or in America or in Europe or anywhere else, just doesn't look at the context. It's a reaction to a story which is almost kind of knee-jerk and that's it. And that's, that really bothers me because if you don't understand the history of what's happening, even if it's in the stock markets or even if it's the strategy that a company has employed over the last couple of decades or even the last decade or the political history of a country or economic history of a country, if you're just reacting knee-jerk it makes no sense whatsoever. And then that's that's where we end up with the shallow, superficial kind of writing that has been talking about. Right. And that bothered me a great deal. It's not just the writing, it's television. It's just a sound bite. Yeah, I'm not a journalist like you, Vivek, or Claire. I would, let's say, comment from the readership side. And one of the things that I can see is that basically most of the news stories, the larger public publications, are based on more of an emotional you know, economy, on the economy of emotions. Is that, is that what you're seeing as well, Claire? Oh, absolutely. It's based on the economy of clicks. What you click on, you get more of. And people like to click on things that get them all worked up. Yeah, and taken to the extreme is where we're getting all the conspiracy theories, all the disinformation, so on and so forth, right? Because that's what sells. And this is, this is a product of the dismembering of the newspaper into its component parts. Newspapers used to be, for our younger readers out there, newspapers actually came on paper. That's where we get the word <laughs> newspaper. And they were widely read, and that's where most people, most people would get their newspaper in the morning on their doorstep. There were things called paper boys. I know it's, it's, it's hard to imagine, but this is how people got their, their news. Right. And they, newspapers turned healthy profits. They could hire very good reporters and very good writers, and they could send them overseas. Even small town newspapers could afford to send foreign correspondents about, abroad to cover the news. What they discovered is the rise of the internet. Editors at the time had no idea what people were reading and what they weren't reading because it was all one thing. And what they discovered is that no one was actually reading the foreign news. They were getting the newspaper because it had a sports section, it had comics, it had Dear Abby, it had the classified ads. And when you could disambiguate things, when Craigslist hmm. broke the model for classified ads, people didn't actually want to read the news. They didn't want to read serious news. They never had wanted to read serious news. It was just a, a, an editor's mm -hmm. illusion that people were interested in that. But nonetheless, in turning the pages to get to the sports section, everyone did have to cast their eyes over the headlines for the news. And so you had a certain body of common information about what was happening in the world don't have that anymore. With a click of a mouse now, you choose which stories you want. And the reason you're getting Harry and Meghan on Oprah over oh and over and over again yeah. is because, well, it's just very simple. Now in the newsroom, they have a scrolling list showing most clicked, and they know exactly how many eyeballs were on a given story. And that's all advertisers care about, right? Advertisers want, when eyeballs on their ad for a specific amount of time, and now we know to the last millisecond how many wow. minutes people spend on it. So every time someone clicks on the royal family, you get another story about the royal family. 
no matter what, no matter how stupid it is, they'll create, they'll keep creating them until the royal family is not number one on the list anymore. If I might just put it. Sure. Yeah, I completely agree with everything that Claire says. But what I found is that editors no longer want to know. They've pre-decided that this is a viewpoint that we're going to take because this is what gets the most clicks, the most eyeballs, whatever. Beyond that, they don't want to know. They don't want to know the other side of the story. Like Claire said in France, if they're saying that police atrocity, well, that's all that they want to know. They don't want to know that there's a deeper story. There's a deeper Malaysian society. And they just don't want to put that into context. And it's not just America or Europe. I see it happening every day in India. I see it happening in all the coverage that I read virtually all over the world. Yes. And that's why ultimately we want the cosmopolitan globalist to be a multilingual yeah. news organization. Oh, that's, a, that's an exciting idea. You know, Vivek, I teach at university and I ask my kids almost every day, how much do you read? And I think it's one of the bigger problems, one of, right, they're, they're so used to reading little tweets or posts and getting them to read something that's a lot longer is much more difficult. They just don't read. And it's not just kids at university, it's something that's happening globally. I agree on that, right? John, you want to jump in on True, this? And that's, yes, I have kids, I have children, two, I have sons about 10 years apart in age. One is 13, one is 21. And the difference is just astounding. Abysmal. And obviously some of that's probably personality, but the one who's 21, he grew up in the age when everyone, every kid ran out to buy Harry Potter books and grew up on tons of science fiction genre novels, moved on to more serious novels. Whereas my younger son is just happy looking at TikTok and YouTube and it's actually a struggle to get him to pick up a book. I'm quite curious. I mean, you say your son's 21 that grew up with Harry Potter. My daughter's 20 and I was probably a far, far, far bigger fan of Harry Potter than she ever was. Mm -hmm. uh, she just doesn't read. They get all their news on Twitter. They get all their news on WhatsApp. That sort of seems to be the limited world that they live in. And there's nothing that I could do. I've got all sorts of books at home and I watch all sorts of te television documentaries, but I just can't get her to read read those books or see those documentaries or see they just live in a very different world. No, and I still subscribe to two paper newspapers um, in the hope that one day maybe with the kids, you know, if you lead by example, maybe the kids will pick one up and be curious. Never seems to work. You can sit there on the table for, for weeks and they'll never pick it up. I know. Well, my big question is whether liberal democracy can survive this. Mm -hmm. That's our big question. We are rapidly losing what one of our globalists, Adam Garfinkel, calls deep literacy. We are rapidly losing the ability to read a complex text and understand what it says. And this is growingly apparent. Our developed countries, the operating system requires deep literacy. You can't understand rule of law unless you can read a law textbook. You can't understand all kinds of complex arguments that are required to live in a liber liberal democracy unless you have the kind of reading comprehension skills that were once absolutely taken for granted. And we're losing them. We're losing them quickly in favor. We're returning to oral culture. There is much of beauty in oral culture. I have nothing against oral culture, but I don't think you can run a modern society on it. No, and I think oral culture traditionally was grounded in people's everyday reality and still had a strong connection with the physical world. Mm -hmm. Whereas now we're seeing oral cultures that don't seem to be tied to much of anything. Like this is totally anecdotal. And if your listeners get upset with me, I'd understand why, because it's just based on limited evidence. But my wife teaches English uh, primarily to Chinese students because she speaks Chinese. And you can imagine the students she's teaching represent some of the more affluent better educated families from the PRC who live in, and live in Europe. And she is just astounded by the, the ignorance of these um, students in terms of geography, history. They just don't care. They couldn't, they can't even find places like Australia on a map. 
Wow. It doesn't bother them at all. They just live in this sort of world of yeah. um, soap operas and, t- and TikTok and social even, media. Even, this is true. Even educated with. Chinese students. Yeah, high school students. Because we're caveat. always hearing how they're, they're whooping our butts in education. Or how, how do they do in STEM? These are younger children. I think they're actually fine. I and mean, they're not, they're, they're good in math and they, they focus a lot on that. But in terms of history and geopolitics, so social sciences, very little knowledge. Have they been educated in the Chinese system until recently or have they always been educated? No, they've been educated actually in the Austrian system. Right. Oh, so, okay. Which, so it's, to be fair, is not great on geography. It tends to focus right. a lot on Austrian geography, which is not a big, not a big topic, not a big country. Beyond ge- geography, what other gaps has she noticed? Uh, history, obviously. Mm-hmm. No interest in, in literature. No, no interest in sort of thinking outside, like cause and effect. Things are what they are. Some things are very good. So the stimulus comes in and they react to it and they're happy that way. In terms of history, do they have sort of an outline in their mind of ancient, medieval, modern history, what the 20th century was like? I think my wife has been rather careful not to poke that too much. Certainly they sort of think that China is is right about most things. They've never heard any other perspectives. I'm sure they know nothing about the Uyghurs or the case for Taiwanese independence. Interesting. Yeah, really very... culture revolution either. I mean, what's the point of their getting an education in the West if they're not going to be exposed to, to those ideas? The point is that they'll get a degree and get a job in, in business at some point. And, and that's it. Yeah. But they're going to go back Real to... Real estate? I don't know. Some might, some might not. I have a slightly different point of view. I mean, I was teaching communication at the university and I found that of a class of about 40, there were about eight to 10 who were bright, curious, intelligent, well-read. They were willing to discuss everything from Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged to George Orwell's 1984 to surprisingly even Karl Marx. But the, the, the rest of the class was just about average. And then I came to another university and then there, they were just not interested. I, I like them to get involved. And they said that this is new to us. We're not taught this way. We just have these professors who come down and say, this is it. And A is A and one plus two is three. And that's, we expected to reproduce that in the exams. So a great deal of what's happening around has to do with, with the education system. I had a couple of Chinese students uh, uh, who were studying here in India and they were absolutely clear that they were here to learn as much as they could about Indian people, but they weren't here to learn an Indian point of view. They wanted to know what makes us tick rather than even the willingness to accept that there was an alternate point of view on Tibet or uh, Taiwan or anything else. And I found that rather strange. These are topics that I think that we're going to be jumping into. Vivek, just to, um, to give a little bit of information from my end here in Siena. Now, we're a medium-sized university. We don't really attract, let's say, top-tier uh, students who would go to Bocconi or they would go to other kinds of universities that offer, um, let's say, globally recognized degree. But I agree with you, Vivek. I've got about maybe tops, 30, 35% of my students are really engaged. And a lot of them know nothing. And and we're talking about Italian students. As you said, bringing everything into context, it's, you know, they, I think it depends on their education system how they've, if it's rote learning, for example, just memorizing material and bringing in and all they're really thinking of is, you know, getting that mark. So the really, really engaged students, the ones that will ask questions, have a better grounding and general knowledge is about not more than 30, 35%. That's my own personal experience over 20 odd years at the university. And it's getting worse and worse. Sorry, buddy. No, that's fine. Uh, That's what happens because these are students who are going out into the world of journalism 
And surprisingly, when I would ask the class, what do you want to do? Do you want to go into PR, advertising, journalism? What is it? And you would have the largest percentage of students saying PR. Why? We paid better. That's right. What, why, what sort of PR do you want to do? Celebrity PR, the movie stars. I mean, are you, are you really studying to do that? Definitely. They definitely are. Claire, you want to jump in here? People who used to go into journalism are now going into PR. Once upon a time, journalism was actually a career. It wasn't just something you sort of had to be sort of embarrassed and say, well, I'm a journalist. And people would say, okay, yeah, but what's your real job? Uh, it was a career. You could be paid a middle-class salary. And in fact, foreign correspondents would live really quite reasonable lives. They would be able to employ a bureau of translators and staffers, and they would be able to do, leave the city and do research in the countryside. All of that is gone now. And journalists, they can't make money anymore. There's just too much information on the internet and it's all free. People do not want to pay for journalism. No one, no one would advise their kid to grow up and become a journalist. And people now hate the media. You, it's well, at least in the United States, you get staggeringly high numbers of people, something like 80% saying they don't trust the media. Well, it's free. You get what you pay for. Yeah. You can you can pay for good information, but you've got to be willing to pay for it. It was initially hoped with the internet that the, there would be something, something would emerge to compensate for this, that because there was so much information out there, surely this would compensate for the loss of professional journalism. But so far, it really hasn't. It really hasn't. There's no one who's figured out how to curate it and present it in a way that rivals what the New York Times was once able to do. The New York Times was once a magnificent newspaper. Hmm. So What's your opinion Post. on it now, Claire? Well, I, I think it would be a great newspaper if you're, you know, trying to figure out how to redecorate your second house in the Hamptons and you're looking for social cues about what's fashionable at a Hamptons dinner party back, you know, if you can ever have a dinner party again. But it's become incredibly provincial. They have some outstanding reporters, some of the best in the field, but the editorial side and the, the perspective is relentlessly that of the Upper East Side and Environs because they don't have people in the field anymore. They have very few people in the field and certainly no one on the editorial desk has any international experience or knowledge because they would, they would catch the kind of things that are coming through as just being implausible on the face of it. But they don't because that's not where they're making their money. And they're incredibly successful. They are, they are by far the most successful newspaper in the world. And some of the things they do are, are really remarkably good. And the New York Times did the best story on the Notre Dame fire, better than anyone in France. So sometimes they get it exactly right, but more often than not, well, I don't know if it's more often, but at least once a week, I see a story from the New York Times that makes me think, this is barely college newspaper level quality and it's so ideological is this the same thing that's happening also in the european press vivek in india what's happening with the press there are we seeing the same trends absolutely it's exactly the same i've been talking about this for the last 15 or 20 years i've been trying to figure out why this is happening then i had occasion to teach go as a visiting faculty at quite a few communication colleges. What I increasingly find is that what they're being taught are the techniques of communication. They're taught that this is what sells. This is how you package it. This is what works. They're not being taught the context around. There aren't enough people in the media here today who would understand history or international relations or politics. From the context, once upon a time, I know that there were journalists who specialized in just one political party and they knew everything that was there to be known about that political party. So if something happened, they could comment on it authoritatively. You just have students who want to know how to give out the right sound device, the right catchphrase. And it's all about techniques. It's all about how I look on 
camera, it's all about how I can write in 150 words that I get that thing out to get the story out ASAP before anyone else does on the internet. So it's all about techniques. It's not about context at all. That's and right. there's very, very, very few students, like you said, maybe 30, 35 percent or possibly less, who really want to take the effort to understand that journalism is meant to put news into, the, into a context. Yes, there's the breaking story. It breaks. But then an hour later, you've got to put a context to the story. In the Indeed. first five minutes, the story breaks. Fine. What happens an hour later, you've got to know the context of the story. These guys who are coming out of this factory today, across the world, communication across the world, I've done this in the UK as well. They're just being taught tools and techniques. They're not being taught the context. None of them know what happened at the Treaty of Versailles or what happened in the Indo-Pakistan war and what was the context of the KGB operating in India the 1970s or what happened with Henry Kissinger and China back in the early 70s. They just don't want to know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Then they pick that up from somewhere and all that they do is put that out in 10 words or less so that it, it's the pretense of knowledge rather than in-depth knowledge. Which Claire brings it's us all back about to packaging. what you were saying before. Correct. Yeah, I, when you consider that almost every American news organ, print and television, has closed down its overseas bureaus. Wow. Uh, during the Cold War, for example, 40% of the news hole, the, the amount of time devoted on network news, foreign coverage. So the, up until the late 1980s, 40% of the broadcast was devoted to stories happening outside of America. CBS had... 14 bureaus, I think, overseas, and 10 smaller ones, and it's stringers in about 50 countries. CBS has shut down its bureau in Paris, in Frankfurt, in Cairo, in Rome, in Nairobi, in Beirut. The larger networks have all just cut down to a handful of stringers. As a result, we have almost no coverage in not just the American media, but especially the American media, out of India. Nothing. No one has any idea what's going on in India. If they see a story, it'll be maybe once a month and it'll be completely without context. Yeah. No news coming out of Africa. It's as if the entire continent has just disappeared. Like, yeah. yeah. It's even more shocking from an American context, I find is the lack of serious coverage of Mexico, which is our yes. very large influential neighbor to the South. Yes, All you get absolutely. is stories about crime, drugs. There's no serious coverage of what's actually going on in Mexican society. Absolutely. How many Americans could tell you who is the president of Mexico? <laughs> no, I'm uh, sorry. I'm laughing yeah. because you're absolutely right. It's, it's always not a funny. joke how Actually, dumb Americans are. Yeah. But it, there's a reason for it. There is no news coverage. Mexico is a difficult country to cover from a news standpoint because journalists there tend to die in horrible ways. Nonetheless, yes. that's, that's a clue that maybe we need more news from there. And we, but funding a bureau in Mexico City and providing security to all of the journalists is just far more than any newspaper is able to do right now. So anyway, I was saying 40% of the news hole was devoted to foreign news during the height of the Cold War. And now it's less than 4%. Wow. And the only places from which we get stories are places where U.S. troops are stationed and nothing else exists. And one of the aspects of the populist wave that we've seen is a sense that the rest of the world can go to hell. Part of the reason people feel this way is they don't know anything about the rest of the world. They don't understand why it's in the history that has led to the United States having bases overseas and a presence overseas. They don't know anything about the people who live in these countries. It's just all a big disambiguated bunch of foreigners. Part of the reason for that is the change in the structure of the news industry. And um, we're losing journalists even from war zones, partly because war criminals have realized that the best bang for your buck is killing the journalists. So mm -hmm. Assad, for example, targeted journalists deliberately. And we, we just do not have the, the view into the rest of the world that we had 40 years ago. 
there's only four national newspapers in the United States, and I'm not even talking about Britain or France or anything like that. The Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Los Angeles Times that do their own independent news coverage. The rest rely on wire services. And uh, in 2003, the Los Angeles Times shut down 43% of its foreign bureaus. And they, they provide foreign coverage for all of the Tribune company papers. So that all just went out the world, out of the, out of the window. So Claire, this is the void. This is the void that you were talking about. And this is also the void where the globalists step in, is it not? I mean, I took the reason why I started reading the globalists was specifically for this, because as you were saying, Vivek, about the context, I was finally understanding some of the issues that were brought to the fore. Uh, For example, just to give you an example, the whole piece that you guys wrote about the Sinocentric future with a question mark. Is that really, you know, the way things are going to go? And I found the in-depth writing on that gave me much more of a context. I understand things a little better. I'm just saying a little better because obviously we can't think that one article is going to solve or answer every single question. But can we say, Claire and John and Vivek, that this is where the globalists are stepping in to provide that context? Would you agree with that? That's exactly right. To provide that context and to provide a perspective that isn't partisan, that isn't narrow, that isn't provincial, that really looks at the whole world and global issues with global significance, but looks at them critically through local eyes. We don't want people parachuting in and speaking to the first 10 government fixers who, who find them as they're fresh off the boat. Well, that, that really happens. I mean, really, it happens. There are so few journalists that one arrives and immediately someone is sent to handle them and they get exactly the story the government wanted them to, wanted them to relate. We need people who are really there, who really live there, native speakers of the language in question who have been through the educational system, who have used the healthcare system, who have been sued in local courts, people who who have a perspective that is, what, what, what we said from the outset was, we want this to be read by people in that country and seen as the best source of news to them, not just to readers back home. Because mostly now American news coverage is the object of mockery around the world because it's so off, it's so ridiculous, it's so completely detached from the reality of that country. We want to be the best source of news, not only for our readers at home, but to the people in the countries we're covering. What is coming up for the globalists? Claire, John, Vivek? John, you... There's tons of stuff because there's the geopolitical, (laughs) environmental, there was a lot of stuff that came out of the Ask Me Anything okay, segment of the globalists, which was geopolitics, environmental, economic, financial issues, bio-warfare, which scared the hell out of me, by the way. I just want to, I just want you guys to know that. John, what's coming up? Well, it's more on the business side, actually acting as business advisor. What's the next direction for the globalists is to become a more professional organization, more efficient, increase our global reach. We are, uh, Vivek and I are working on setting up a back office in India which will give us more coverage in India, expanding our, our base of collaborators and, and contr- contributors. Vivek, do you want to jump in here? Yeah, the key now for us is to actually launch a website and make sure that it gets as many hits as it can. But having said that, I don't ever want to fall into the trap. None of us do of just maximizing hits and falling in for the same tools and techniques, as I call them, of eyeballs and click through through rates and all the jargon that's used nowadays. I'd much rather have people who want content. And the more I talk to people, uh, the more I realize that this is a vacuum. People who are in business want to know more about not just what's happening in business in India, but increasingly about everything that's happening in trade, not just here, everywhere. They need to know more and more about what's happening with technology, uh, how technology is shaping economics. They just don't want sound bites on this. They don't want to hear the 140 character tweet. It's the whole context around it. It's the whole 
analysis around it that doesn't base itself in a certain ideology that doesn't turn around and say that everything's left or everything's right or everything islamist or everything's christian evangelical christian or hindu or anything else no, right those that. things exist but there's a bigger question and there's a reason why these kind of provincial attitudes are coming up yeah. and we need to explore some of that as well claire i'm going to leave you with the last word what are we doing next week claire by the way what are we going to be talking about have you got any idea or is it going to be a surprise how about next week we talk about the pandemic we have been running a series about what it will take to vaccinate the entire world We've already published three parts of it about the vaccines, the manu manufacturing, and wait a moment, we haven't published three parts. We were, um, we're working right now, we're editing part three on the logistics of administering vaccines to everyone in the world. So let's talk about that next week. But that is the kind of story the cosmopolitan globalist wants to treat. It's a genuinely global issue. We are interested in genuinely global stories. So arms control, for example, from a genuinely global point of view, free trade from a genuinely global point of view. Uh, we, we published what I thought was a wonderful story by Simone Franco about Venezuela, about the history of Venezuela and how Venezuela came to be a yeah, basket no. case, even though it was once the wealthiest country in the region. And this is a story that I, I thought his was the best piece I've read about it because I understood at last how this had happened. Generally, whenever we hear anything about Venezuela, we hear it as a morality tale. This is what happens if you if you elect socialists, don't elect Bernie Sanders, which is an irrelevant, irrelevant commentary on Venezuela. It's again part of this trend of seeing every other country through the prism of, in this case, American politics, party politics. And we're very interested in publishing more stories like that, stories from people who are capable of writing a story for a global audience from a global perspective, but with that depth of local knowledge. And you ask what, what stories are in the pipeline. I'm gonna be working on a story about Biden's first 100 days in office, but that, that you'll have to wait for the first 100 days for that. That's right, April the 25th. That's <laughs> yeah. the date that you guys set for that one, exactly. Vivek is going to be looking at the question of biowarfare. Um, we're looking, <laughs> remind me, John, what are you working on right now? I've been trying to look at the European reaction to Brexit, the odd lack of concern that a lot of Europeans seem to have with um, you know, losing an economy the size of California and yeah. one of the uh, most important cultural elements of the EU, if you look on a global basis. And how you know, in Germany and Austria, certainly, there's been sort of a lot of schadenfreude about that, like, well, good riddance. You know, the Europeans should think about this a little more seriously, what that means both for the future of the EU. And maybe some in introspection of what has the EU not done so well encourage the UK to leave, which, you know, in the light of the current sort of debacle about vaccines has maybe become even more an issue. Yes, yes. Yeah. Our next podcast is going to be on the pandemic and yes. the response to the pandemic. Absolutely fabulous. And then week by week, we'll set exactly what we would like to talk about and what we want to bring, okay, exactly. to all our readers. Okay. Exactly. And you'll so, all 88 of us. All 88 of us. All 88 of us. Okay. So I'd like to say goodbye to everybody who is listening in. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that we were able to provide some information about the globalists, what we're working on, and that you got to listen to Vivek and Claire and John and meet them a little more. And so I'm going to say goodbye to you, Vivek, Claire, and John, and to everyone. Thank you, Monique. Okay, it'll, it's my pleasure. Bye, Bye guys.